this is what our faith is made for. We have a faith made for the worst of times. And to find the best of time in the worst of times. As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. I've been looking forward to sharing this Lent talk number 138 with you. The passages for the 13th of November, 2022 are uniquely synced in some way. I have no idea how, but I'm gonna kind of park at the Luke, the gospel text, a reading for today, but I want um, I want to just say that I think the, the parts of each one of these—the Isaiah text, the Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and the and all of the the Luke passage—need to be read orally to your people. Just to, especially the the weight and gravity of the of the Luke text, and uh, so we're, we're gonna. I just want to read a couple of things that I think you would. It would help your people to hear from the, the, the story. Um, first of all, the first reading is Isaiah 65. It begins with this. This is wonderful. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy, and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more. And it goes on. No more. No more. Oh, what hope. What hope. And then there's the, the final... Um, line in the Second Thessalonians 3 passage. And remember, the Bible written in chronological order, the New Testament would begin not with Matthew or even Mark, the earliest gospel, would begin with First Thessalonians. So this would be at the very beginning of the, of the New Testament if it were written or presented in chronological order. Verse 13, brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Or as I learned it as a, as a kid learning, memorizing scripture, do not be weary in well-doing. And that alliteration, weary and well-doing, is, is a memory marker, keeps it fixed. Um, because between this interim, between God is doing this new thing and, and all that's going on now, um, it's easy to get weary in in doing what is right, in well doing. I love the word well because it well doing suggests that sozo component of health and wellness and healing. And and that's 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 our ministry, is that well doing. But here's the gospel of Luke. Now, last week we did previous verses to this passage, previous uh, the previous story, the widow's might. Um and here uh, we are um, immediately ushered into um, for somebody doing semiotics is one of the one of the best, most exciting passages in in Jesus's ministry. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, "As for these things that you see." The days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. Now, you got to put this in, in context. Um, Jesus chooses 
for his team, not people from the temple, not the Diascalos, not the PhDs, not the, the, the esteemed rabbis that could start taking disciples when they got to the age of 30. But he, he, he chooses from the highways and byways and backwaters. And there are 204 Galilean villages, small villages, um, a lot of them just farmers. And, and um, Nazareth was one of those 204 Galilean villages. And each village was kind of like a family compound. And, and for them, the temple, I mean, the temple. It was the holiest place on earth, housing the holiest place on, on earth, the Holy of Holies, the cube, which represented the cube of the New Jerusalem. Heaven is a cube. Read, read, read uh, Revelation. And, and you have the, 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 all the, this huge expanse. Some people, some scholars are saying that we have no idea how, the, this, how big this temple was, huge. So maybe, maybe one of the courtyards could, could accommodate a couple hundred thousand less, like stadium size, just for one of the courtyards. And, and adorned and festooned with jewels and gems and gold and, and, and images of the garden. A garden temple and Jesus is saying you know he, there's a there's going to be a new cornerstone I'm the chief cornerstone and you are all temples so, so you're parts of this new Jerusalem that this new heaven and this new earth that's going up that Isaiah is is talking about they ask him teacher when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place okay now what what they're doing here is they're saying okay Talk to us about how do we read the signs? Um, and the Greek word for sign, we get semiotics from it. So they're asking for a semiotics class. And what Jesus does next, and I love this, he gives them a crash course, semiotics 101, boot camp in semiotics, if you will. But it's based on not this sign means this and this sign means this, but it's based on you learning to read the sign. It's like the best education is not learning a body of knowledge, it's learning how to learn so that you can keep learning for the rest of your life, for lifelong learning. Um, that's the best pedagogy. That's the best education is not learning this information and this knowledge. It's learning how to learn. Marshall McLuhan said, in the future, nobody will earn a living. They will learn a living. And when half-lives of bodies of knowledge, I mean, if you get a PhD today in biology, Six years from now, the half-life of, bio, of biological education is, uh, uh, biological science is six years. In other words, in six years, 50% of what you know today that you think is true is now wrong because the knowledge base has exploded. The half-life is getting shorter and shorter. Half-life of scientific education is six years. The half-life of an engineering education, three years. The half-life of computer education, <laughs> okay, you, you used to think about, you know, 18 months, you know, Moore's Law. No, I think it's shorter than that now. I mean, things are just, change is no longer incremental, ex exponential. And so Jesus is teaching them not, okay, this sign means this, sign means this. Sign. No, he's saying, he's teaching them how to learn, how to read these signs. And he begins with, this is not how you read this sign. He begins with, a bunch of no's and nots. This passage, um, they will arrest you. They will persecute you. All this is going to happen. All this is, you know, but this is not the end. All oh, this is not it. This is not it. This is going to happen. This is not it. Jesus is priming us. We have a faith built for the worst of times. That's why I'm calling this Lent Talk, finding the best of times in the worst of times. And this is what our faith is made for. We have a faith made for the worst of times. And to find the best of time in the worst of times. We are careening 
in a world of polycrisis. This is a new word, polycrisis. Poly means many crises, you know, crisis. We had so many crises. They're just popping up here and there like popcorn. There are crises here, crises there, crises there. Many crises. How do you, how do you handle a world of, where, of, of many, many crises? We're hearing words for the first time like the last chance for humanity, the last chance for the planet, the last chance for this, the last chance for that. And then we're even hearing words that should never pass out of the mouth of a Christian, ever, ever. Too late for the planet, too late for humanity, too late, too late. It is never too late. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Jesus human, it is never too late. That words don't belong in your mouth. Never too late. There is always hope. So Jesus here is helping his disciples in this boot camp, Semiotics 101, this crash course, in helping them to not telling us what the signs mean, but telling us how to read them and how not to read them. Now, remember, the ultimate sign we are scanning and brailing and, and signing and signaling is Jesus. Everyone is looking for you. Remember that? Everyone is looking for you, the disciple said to Jesus. And that's true. And so we, the ultimate sign, because we want to know, we want to know where Jesus is, so we can join him in what he's doing, and and so that's the ultimate sign. And we're and th th this is a time signs are just exploding like fireworks all around us. We're living in a time of seismic upheaval, tsunami change, volcanic activities, catastrophic thinking. Um, in, in a in a book a collection of essays called Red Skies. I wrote the introductory essay, and I just say that the 21st century may be the most dangerous century in history, and that around every corner is lurking these red danger signs. Um, and it's more important than ever that we see what's on the horizon, but Jesus didn't just teach us to read a room. He didn't just teach us to read a planet. He taught us to read the cosmos, to read um, the whole world, and how not to read it. And this is where Jesus starts. Not. It's not this. It's not that. It's not this. When you see this, it's not. Much of the prophetic wing of the church has ignored this passage of Scripture. It's not taking seriously Jesus' not this, not that, don't this, don't that. you got to deal with the nots and the don'ts before you deal with the yeses and the do's. And here Jesus is um, giving us um, the outline a num of a n upcoming number of events that are not immediate signs of, of the end and of uh, his nearness. So one of the first requirements of semiotics is not to read certain signs as definitive. They may be significant, they may be um, revealing, uh, but they are not definitive of, they, they're more descriptive than definitive. So, this is verse eight. Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he, the time is near. Here it comes. Do not follow them. Did you hear that? Do not follow them. We live in a celebrity culture. Pop culture is a revolving carousel of revolting celebrities. And much of the church, the celebrities may not be revolting, but it's just... A celebrity culture turns everything it touches into an idol. And living Christ in a celebrity culture refuses and refutes idolatry. But hear me, at the same time it embraces iconography. Or what I call economics. An idol points to itself. There's never an idol and an icon. An idol points to itself and says, look at me, worship me, look how important I am, look how... how, um, how how rev revelatory I am. An icon 
points away from itself. It doesn't point to itself. It points away from itself. Don't look at me. Look beyond me. Look through me. Look to the one who is greater than me. Look to the one who, the one who you should worship. It's not me. It is Jesus. So an icon points away from itself towards the worship of Jesus. An idol points to itself to the worship of, of the idol. Look through me to Jesus. Worship him. That's an icon. A celeb people need icons. In a celebrity culture, people need icons. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be an icon. But this culture wants you to become a celebrity, an idol. The celebrity culture majors in personalities and minors in personhood. And this is dangerous because celebrity is based on the fantasy of intimacy. When we spell, let me put it like this. When the fantasy fades, and blows up. When the spell of the magic and the fantasy is broken, the celebrant, and in the celebrity culture, everybody's a celebrant. They, they're celebrant, celebrating, they're celebrant, the celebrity. The celebrants, when the fantasy, when you see what's behind the personality, you see the personhood. Um, the celebrant's blood boils and goes on the warpath, out for blood, to make the fantasy either real one way or the other. And this is why, with very few exceptions, celebrities, what, what, what celebrants create, they can decreate and destroy. And celebrities are brought down to crash and burn, as surely a celebrity culture will crash and burn. What we've created, we think we can chew up and spit out and and um, step on. And um, besides, when when you give in to the celebrity culture, you, the real you, vanishes in the spotlight. You disappear into the spotlight. And you become something that you're not. You become the creation of the celebrant. And this is the danger of celebrityhood. I, I looking at my bookshelf across the way, and um, I have a whole rack of Lies of the Saints. And medieval culture especially loved to collect Lives of the Saints. We are still collecting Lives of the Saints, business biographies, celebrity autobiographies. We canonize people, making their books sell like hotcakes. As for the real saints, they sell like cold oatmeal. But Jesus says, um, do not follow them. Um, now, he also says expect political and military upheavals. He says, when you have these political changes, we just went through a week of political changes, uh, they're not the signs of my nearness. In fact, Jesus gets as clear as he can get. The end will not come right away after these political and military upheavals. So all this thing, oh, we're going to bring in a whole new, you know, and, and put your hopes into politics of, of the world. Um, no. Jesus says, this is not, this is, this is not providence. In fact, progress and providence are opposites. They're antitheses. Um, Jesus predicts there will be earthquakes, famines, disease, epidemics, plagues, uh, there will be signs from heaven, he says, but these two are not, okay, one after the other. It's not this, it's not this. See that sign, it's not that, it's not, doesn't have the th significance you think it does. Um, and um, many will say they are, but, but in the midst of all this chaos, um, you can find hope um, and, and hope. Yes, hope that I'm coming, but hope that I'm, I'm come now. Um, Maranatha, Aramaic, three tenses to the one word. Jesus has come, Jesus is here, and Jesus is coming. You live out of all three at the same time in the midst of this chaos. Now, first time chaos comes into English usage is in the end of the 14th century. When we're translating for the first time the uh, Latin Vulgate into English. And here's the Luke 16, 26. There is a great chaos betwixt us and you. 
Now, today we hear chasm means literally abyss, chasm, void, but the first time in English, uh, chaos comes out um, as the word comes out of the Greek, K-H-A-O-S, as, as chaos here. Chaos often was uh, personified as a god or a person. And it comes with some, some strange and scary bedfellows. With chaos comes the bedfellow of bedlam and pandemonium and, and anarchy and mayhem, which comes from the word maim, by the way. But thank you for chaos theory. Um, chaos theory, a physics theory that was introduced in 1972 by a meteorologist. And I want to give this guy credit because he's quoted everybody, quotes him, but they quote him as if it's their words, their phrases. In 1972, he gave a speech before the American Association for the Advancement of Science, one of the prestige associations in the scientific world. And he introduced this concept of chaos theory, that, that times of chaos are also times of tremendous creativity and innovation and, 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 and um, imagination and times of accelerated change. And he, his phrase was that a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil can create a tornado in Texas. That's his phrase, that's his line, Edward Lorenz. And the point is that small inputs, a small input of kindness, small input of forgiveness, a small input of just niceness, can have huge consequences around the world, can have a worldwide impact. That the power of one to affect either good or evil has never been greater. Oh, if, if we could get this. Um, so chaos theory, um, and this is a time of great chaos, but even the, in the midst of the chaos, the hope is, is huge. And then comes this final section about persecution, that Jesus is warning us that we will, um, that there will be uh, persecution. The Greek word for persecution means to, to, um, to harass someone, but harass someone meaning you, you, you run after them, you hasten to get to them. Um, and you know, you're, you're running down people for disagreeing, whatever. And, um, we can we can expect um, the more the world seems to be falling apart um, and does fall apart that we can be run down and even even captured um, and then and and persecuted and and the Jesus is saying here but the words don't don't worry about this don't don't you go, don't try and plan your life to say, okay, no, if this happens to me, then I'm going to say this. If this happens to me, this is going to be my defense. Um, the, the more time you spend um, fretting over what's going to happen, the more you forfeit the moment and, and, um, and forget the future and, and abandon the, the joy of, of living in this, in this moment. Um, this is 14 to 15. Make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Uh, in the original Greek here, the, Greek, the verb is an imperative. Put it in your hearts not to prepare your defense. And this is another not. Um, so the semiotics is all about, uh, first of all, do no harm, not. Um... So, I, I have a, my favorite preacher in the world. I dedicated my preaching text uh, called Giving Blood to him. 42 years, been faithful. Uh, faithful Baptist. Uh, Los Angeles, in next year, he's repositioning. He doesn't like the word retire. So he's repositioning his relationship to the church. Uh, he's wanted as a speaker all over the world. And so I don't know what exactly God has in store for his his next 30 years, but um, his, his number one recommendation to preachers as they work on a message is don't prepare a sermon, prepare the preacher. Don't prepare a sermon. In other words, don't, 
detail, a manuscript, and all this stuff. Prepare you. So let that story, so let that, that passage marinate your mind and soak your spirit that you then, that the, the spirit will give you and you yourself become the, the message. Uh, uh, don't worry beforehand. That's the NIV. Don't meditate before the King James Version. Uh, pro meliteo is the Greek. Uh, deliberate, detailed, uh, jot and tittle defense. No. Um, planning is control. Preparedness is surrender. Trust the Spirit. See, when, when you plan your defense and, and plan what you're going to uh, say, um, you, you lose the serendipity of surprise and the and the surrender of trusting the Spirit. In the surrender, by the way, you save your life and you find new life. Compassion on yourself. Passion for others. And you find yourself understanding the trials that beset us all. Not as misery that has no meaning or muddles that have no exit, but as mirrors for identity and avenues for further mission. In surrender, you can set the future where it belongs, well in front of you, and you can see God around you right now with every step you take. So Jesus is saying here, no marshalling of mental and intellectual forces, no strategic uh, blueprints that lock you in for years upon years, no nail-down campaign tactics that kind of take into account the movements of others around you or the shifting sands of, of the culture. Um, trust the Spirit. Just trust the Spirit. Surf the Spirit. Um, and that surfing and trusting will give you the metaphors and the stories you need so that the truth of Jesus will, will haunt and, and hound them. And finally, and this had to hurt Jesus so much that he even talk about this. Jesus says that you will, there will be betrayal. Betrayal. And the one he mentions first is betrayal of family and friends. And Jesus knew this intimately. Um, some of the harshest things he has to say are about family for this reason. Uh, he knew family betrayal. Let me, let me just give you one case study, James. Think about this for a moment. James. Jesus had four brothers. This is Matthew 13, 55. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. That's how they're listed. First one listed is James, which means that he was the oldest of the four. Um, Jesus grew up with them. They worked together with their father. Um, and James um, had nothing to do with Jesus' ministry. You ever wonder, Jesus is there, supposedly in Nazareth for 30 years. He's hanging out with James and working with his brothers, especially the oldest. Um, and now he's 30. Now 30 in the first century is aged and sage. You couldn't be, you couldn't, a rabbi couldn't take on disciples until 30. That's why Jesus is fitting a pattern here. Pattern here. Uh, you had enough gravitas at 30. Um, it's not a young and fearless prophet in the first century. Uh, you, life expectancy of a male born in the first century was 26. So 30 was, you know, not, not a lot of people lived to 30, and 30 was a, a gravitas age. You became an adult at 14, economically independent, with an arranged marriage. Um, so this is an, another doubling of that, uh, almost, or well, more than that. So where's Jesus' family? He doesn't choose his family to... He chose some of John's disciples first. And why are his family not part of his ministry? And well, you know one reason, because when he goes back to his hometown for his hometown homecoming and outing, um, they loved his message and they cheered him, right? Oh, no. It, we have somebody from this town that claims to be what? And so they lead a posse. That's, that tries to do an honors killing because he brought such betrayal and shame to his own family by claiming to be the one in whom the scriptures are 
fulfilled. And who had to leave that posse? Um, this is all family compound, Nazareth. It had to be James. Because James is the one that's most responsible for, for Jesus, supposing that Joseph had died by now, which I think he had. So James, the adversary, this is another Paul story. The number one, his number one hometown. During Jesus' life, what did his family do? They came periodically to, to try and take him away because he was embarrassing them so much by what he was saying. And Jesus wouldn't even see them sometimes and had some of the harshest things, you know, let the dead bury the dead. And, you know, I have a new family, and the fam my new family is, is not a biological blood family. It, um, so what happens, the James, um, who betrays him, by the way, all the disciples betrayed Jesus, not just one, they all did. Those closest to you, I don't care who is closest to you, they will betray you. That's why Jesus had a friendship network outside of the disciples, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, uh, where he could really tell what he was thinking, um, and had a safe place called Bethany. Um, but the, um, the disciples here um, are not, James is not part of the disciples, but in the early church, he founds the church of Jerusalem. He becomes a huge figure. Even Paul uses James to authenticate his ministry. Did you ever see this in Galatians 1.19? I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. So James is used by Paul to authenticate his apostleship, even though he, like James, was not one of the 15 and not one of the 12. And this is how important James was. When, when the early church couldn't decide whether non-Jewish followers of Jesus needed to follow Jesus law, uh, Jewish laws, James himself convened a high-powered um, kind of con conference um, in Jerusalem, and all the bigwigs came. Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and they all gave witness to what they thought about this issue. Should non-Jewish followers of Jesus have to follow Jewish laws? And on the basis of that testimony, this is Acts 15. Let me just read to you verse 19. And this is James speaking after all of this. All the testimony. Therefore, my judgment is... This is James. James is giving his judgment on Peter, Paul, uh, Barnabas, all the other. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. Um, so James himself, I mean, how does this happen? He, he's the one that is kind of settling disputes. Um, now, James does not live long. Um, we know, learn from Josephus, the first century historian, that even though James is seen, the book of James that he wrote is seen as a really kind of a, a law book, um, the Jewish establishment accused him of breaking certain Jewish laws. And um, got so angry at him, they took him from a high cliff in the temple, one of the high walls, threw him down on the rocks. When he fell, he was still alive. So they went after him with clubs and stones. So he got the, there's two forms of stoning, which is capital punishment for Jews. He got both of them. He got thrown off the high cliff on the rocks, but he didn't die. And then he got stoned once he was down there, which is the other form of stoning. There was stoning, throwing off a high cliff, stoning puts you in the pit and throwing stones at you. But here, why, why does James get so uh, immediately pushed to a, a, a power position? And I, I'm, I'm just, this is just me here. But Jesus is king. And in the mentality of the day, kings passed on their dynasty through blood. And when the king of kings left planet Earth, who was the next in line by blood, and it was James. And now that he had had this Damascus Road experience, whatever it was for him, the early church looked to him and, um, and his 
is leadership. Um, the ultimate betrayal family. Um, families have betrayed each other. Families betrayed each other to the Nazis with the, with the yellow stars. Families betrayed um, each other to the Inquisition. Christians had to wear yellow crosses. In the early days of the Marxist revolution, um, children in the school systems were encouraged by parents, if they're, by, by teachers, if their parents at home were not reading faithfully, like a Bible, the Communist Manifesto to them, they were to wear red scars to out their parents and to shame their parents for not being a part of the, the Bolshevik, the Communist uh, Revolution. Um, we will be betrayed, and those you trust the most will betray you the greatest, even, Jesus said, to the point of being put to death, which is what happened to him with Judas. Um, so we can expect um, a climate of suspicion, persecution, subtle or blatant. Uh, but in the midst of all of this, what does First Peter 3.15 say? How do we handle it? We don't condemn. We don't defend. We don't get angry. Give reason for the hope that is in you. Our apologetics is one of hope. It's not despair. It's not attack. It's not unfairness. It's reason for the hope. But give reason for the hope. Physically, we may die. But resurrectionally, we live in the glory and grandeur of the presence of Jesus. And this is where not a hair on our head. Jesus has numbered all of our hairs. And not a hair on our head um, will be harmed in that resurrection form because we will have maintained our identity in the presence of of Jesus. Jesus resurrection guarantees our identity into eternity. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. We enter the glory of Christ's presence and are rescued, redeemed, and resurrected with Christ. So followers of Jesus, we do the best of things in the worst of times and have the best of times doing it. And even, and this is Seneca's advice to gladiators, we're not gladiators of war, we're gladiators of grace. And Seneca told the, the gladiators for the Colosseum, if you cannot fight on your feet, learn to fight on your knees. And when we are knocked down, and so we can't even, till we can't even get up, then that's when we make knee prints in the ground. For the church has always grown tallest on its knees. And we learn to engage the culture on our knees. Let us do the best of things in the worst of times and have the best of time doing.